By the time a woman is 45 years old, she will have tried 61 diets. Why is it so tough to keep weight off? It gets to this idea of truthiness, or there's a little bit of science, but then it's several leaps to some of the claims that you see. The minute you even just relax the diet, that weight's coming back. Americans find doing their own taxes simpler than improving diet and health. People do not base their decisions around what to eat on whether it's healthy or not. This is a cultural obsession that we've had for a very long time. It's not about health, it's about appearance. If you're doing this for the looks, you're going to be disappointed. It's no surprise that the people are confused. I came to the point where I just want to live. We all want to stay young forever. There's an entire industry that has talked into being dissatisfied with ourselves. But we live in a world full of noise. Celebrity diets and detox. Of science versus pop culture. <sighs> I'm here to change that. Thanks for having me here. Weight loss. We live in a society consumed by the idea of weight loss. It's been a cultural obsession for a long time. There have been gimmicks, there have been strategies, there have been weight loss techniques that have all been aimed at that elusive goal of sustained weight loss. We have been bombarded with buzzwords, magic solutions, late night TV miracle merchandise, calorie burning potions. The message, strive to be a slimmer, better you. When it comes to exercise, it's really about an active lifestyle. Yet studies consistently show that few of us have actually adopted a healthy lifestyle. We want easy answers. Something quick, something now. Think of all of the diets that have been around and the outrageous diets keep coming. New, often extreme weight loss strategies are constantly emerging, but they all push the same thing. It has become a cultural norm, the idea that we should all be concerned all the time with losing weight. If you have Lord Byron's vinegar and water diet, which is pretty minimal, Fletcherism. This is Horace Fletcher. He said that you should chew your food 32 times, always 32 times. You have the smoking diet, you have the grapefruit diet, just grapefruit, the tapeworm diet, the sleeping beauty diet. How does it work? You put people to sleep because they don't eat when they're sleeping. The Scarsdale diet, you have the paleo diet, you have eat right for your blood type diet, on and on it goes. But this is my absolute favorite one, the air diet. Madonna used it and what is it? You just pretend like you're eating, and then you don't eat any calories. If you can sustain that strategy, I can almost guarantee you lose a little bit of weight. None of them work long term, okay? All of them work short term. This is Dr. Sharma. He's a renowned expert in navigating the complex area of weight loss and obesity. But if you have to look at the facts, is this a diet that somebody can stay on? Uh, because you're gonna have to stay on the diet. The minute you even just relax the diet, that weight's coming back. People always think is, you know what, I need something to get my weight loss started. As though you're starting on a process that's then somehow magically going to continue till you disappear. That's just not how weight loss works. By the time a woman is 45 years old, on average, she will have tried 61 diets. 61 diets, does that sound reasonable to you guys? And the average woman will spend 31 years dieting. So when I say this is a cultural obsession, I mean, this is a cultural obsession, and it's an obsession that we've had for a very long time. The data that found that only 6% of all overweight individuals lost and maintained at least 5% of their weight. So the, again, grim, grim data. When you look at the randomized controlled trials comparing one diet to another diet, maybe to a third diet, what they all show you is, yes, people lose weight. They approximately lose the same amount of weight on all of these diets. And when you look at the long-term results, which means you're not looking at people who are actually on these diets for, say, two years, three years, four years. The differences are marginal. Grim data, marginal results, and a population of endlessly frustrated individuals. Is this a healthy approach to life? 
the vast majority of people don't wake up every morning worrying about their weight. One of the reasons why it's so difficult to change population eating behaviors towards healthier eating is because people do not base their decisions around what to eat on whether it's healthy or not. Right? Those decisions that every marketing guy will tell you, the three things that determine what normal people eat, taste, cost, and convenience. Health is number 27 on that list. Like it, it, It's not what guides decision making around eating. So the challenge is not how do I get people who are already doing stuff to do more. The question is how do I get people who are doing nothing to do even a little bit. This preoccupation with weight loss has generated many complex questions, but unfortunately few very clear answers. Either one of you ever been on a diet? I have been on a diet, yeah. yes. I try to and then it doesn't really last. It's so easy to do that for two days. And then the third day is like, oh, I don't know about this anymore. They're really big on cheat days. Do you know anyone where dieting has been radically successful long term? Not really. <laughs> Not <laughs> really. Knowing all this, is there a winning strategy? Can we find a way to shed the weight? What is the problem? The problem with all diets is not whether or not they help you lose weight. The problem with all diets is, do they help you keep weight off? And that's where virtually all diets fail. Or you could say, that's where all diets are equal. Our perception of the ideal body has evolved over the years. There have been times when being more shapely was associated with wealth, health, and sexuality. We began to see an intensifying obsession with staying slim. Popular culture, including the rise of TV, helped to spread these cultural ideals. Now, social media pressures us to always be camera ready. It distorts our view of what is normal, tricks us into comparing ourselves to unrealistic images. All of this has likely added to our insecurities about our weight. Why is it so tough to keep weight off? Your body will do everything it can to keep you at whatever weight you're at. And one of the best examples of this is the well-known uh, study on the Biggest Loser competition. Everyone remembers the show and its popularity. The cheeky title that put overweight individuals against each other in a competition to get thin. The immediate result? Incredible physical changes. When the show was over, like so many things on TV, it wasn't exactly as it appeared. Six years after the show, 14 of the 16 competitors participated in a follow-up study done by researchers from the National Institutes of Health. What happened is they lost massive amounts of weight. Six years later, what happens? They put all the weight back on. They were burning 600 calories less than when they began. Of course, their body weight was lower, but that was beyond of what they decreased in body weight. Wow. The impacts on these people was terrible in terms of their metabolism, and then they all gained the weight back. You know, we're all built a certain way genetically, and you're fighting against that to look a certain way. It's going to backfire, and it's probably going to rebound even further than where you want it to be. The sustainability of weight loss is really the problem. That's where it doesn't matter what the diet is, it doesn't matter what the exercise program is, you're always up against your body that wants to bring you back to square one, which means your body wants to defend the weight. Your body wants you to keep the weight on. It's constantly trying to keep the weight on. Some scholars have gone so far to suggest that diets do not work. There is little to support the notion that diets lead to lasting weight loss or health benefits. Absolutely everyone can agree that diets do not take you to where pop culture says dieting will take you. Dieting does not take you to these kinds of bodies. Pop culture causes us to focus on one thing with weight loss. It's not health, it's looking good. The fashion industry pretty much lives off talking us into being dissatisfied with the way we look and the way we appear, and then offer solutions because that's what they're selling. And if there's one thing we know about diet and exercise is, if you're doing this for the looks, you're going to be disappointed. And all of us want to look good, of course, but uh, from an exercise message, that's not the one you should focus on. Countless misperceptions and myths have helped the weight loss industry thrive. It's a world full of lies and false promises. And this noise is repeated again and again and again. I actually think this is one of the greatest myths there is around fitness. What is this myth? It's the spot reduction myth. 
It's this idea that you can work a particular part of your body and lose weight on it. The theory behind spot reduction is that when you exercise a set of muscles, fat is lost in that area. Most commonly targeted are the abs and stomach fat. However, this isn't how it works. Exercising a part of the body does not reduce fat in that region. It's impossible to do, but uh, you constantly see products out there or strategies to try and target your abs and, uh, and lose all the, the weight there. It gets back to this idea of truthiness, or there's a little bit of, of science, but then it's several leaps to some of the claims that you see. Of course, these fitness fairy tales have been pushed on us by popular culture. Studies tell us that magazines can be an important source of health information, and they often contain celebrity weight loss stories and advice on how to slim down. I decided to dig deeper to get a better sense of how popular magazines represent weight loss, health, and fitness. So I went through every single People magazine for a year, uh, and I wanted to get a sense of how they talked about health and how they talked about weight and how they talked about weight loss. Uh, and I mean, I read it <laughs> cover to cover, and it was incredible. I really noticed a incredibly strong theme emerging, uh, and that is, you know, it's not about health, it's about appearance. And you know what? It was really the same in every single magazine. 77% of those articles uh, were about appearance, not about health. Even when they were framed kind of as a health story, the core of the article was about how you're going to look. It shouldn't surprise us, right? Because data tells us we all care about our looks and it is the primary motivator. And of course, magazines focus on that. Women's Health will tell you how to look great naked, look great naked, look great naked, look better naked, and have great abs, right? That's the message, that's the focus uh, in popular culture. And of course, that's also the focus of a, a lot of gimmick products. People have been marketing bizarre weight loss products for years. The late night infomercials seem to be home to the most absurd. Everything from shake weights to thigh masters to sauna suits to muscle building toys and gadgets. Every product is presented as the ideal solution to our weight loss and fitness problems. A report by the FTC found that up to 55% of the ads include claims that were either false or misleading. And this evidence-free industry is just one small part of a weight loss market that is expected to be worth over $200 billion by 2019. I don't know if you guys remember the Reebok Retone. Just by wearing these shoes, you're gonna get a better butt, you're gonna get better legs. Those shoes will give you 28% more toning. I don't even know what that means. I think this is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, in addition to that, the FTC thinks it's absolutely ridiculous. In fact, they settled a claim against Reebok and said that you had to pay $25 million out to the people that bought this product. You can't blame the public for being confused. No, that's fair. And, and especially, you know, you see these ads now in all of the magazines, and it might even have some sort of scientific reference, but how many people would ever go and check that? How many people would even have the knowledge to evaluate what sort of science uh, it was? So it's no surprise that the people are confused. This confusion, promoted by advertisers selling unproven products and promises, has added to the public health challenges associated with weight loss. And one of the biggest areas of confusion understanding what exercise does and does not do for us. A lot of this advertising, a lot of the way that weight loss is presented in popular culture focuses on the idea that you can exercise your way thin. That's problematic because of the focus on appearance, but also because exercise doesn't work that way. Exercise alone is not a great weight loss strategy. What drives you the most crazy about how fitness and weight loss is presented to the universe? What drives me crazy is that they talk about physical activity and weight loss together. Because first of all, physical activity doesn't necessarily lead to weight loss. In fact, it rarely does. And I don't care what your body size is, you can be physically active and get a ton of health benefits. A lot of people think you exercise to lose weight and that's what transfers into the health benefit. No, there's this direct line between exercise and health, even if you're overweight or obese, boosting your fitness can bring your relative risk down of developing diseases or your risk of dying almost similar to a normal weight person. If you add up 
the amount of exercise it's going to take to burn off a donut or something like that. You know, for most people, you're talking half an hour or so. It's easier just not to eat the donut. If all you ever hear about are seeing fitness magazines and seeing the media and see everywhere that uh, the reason to be physically active is to lose weight, you automatically associate that and then that's what you think should be the reason that you're doing this behavior even though there's a million other reasons why you should be doing it and you're not going to lose weight necessarily even if you do do it. So my message is I don't care who you are, I don't care what you look like, I don't care what your body shape is, just move because you're going to get benefits from it. We're told to work out in order to look good, to get ready for the beach, to be bikini ready. For guys, it's to have sexy abs, right? Uh, and all those are kind of artificial endpoints. We should really be embracing exercise because it makes you healthy. It gives you a better quality of life. The other thing that pop culture does, and I think this is fascinating, is it allows these ridiculous fad diets to take hold, it allows these fad diets to really become tremendously popular. Of course, fad diets are a big part of the weight loss industry. They promise quick results, and they usually involve a unique combination of foods or the elimination or reduction of particular food groups, fats, protein, or carbs. New ones pop up every year, and the goal is almost always the same, rapid weight reduction. Celebrities can play a big role in the spread and uptake of fad diets, particularly in the current media environment. Presenting themselves as a success story, they can help sell the quick fix mentality. The list of these diets is unending. The South Beach diet, the Zone diet, the Atkins diet, Eat Right for Your Blood type diet, Park Avenue diet, Alkaline diet, and on and on and on. Every time there's a new diet, and it doesn't matter how crazy the diet is, but when the people who come off of the jump, first of all, pretend like they've invented something that nobody's done before. It's all nonsense. You go back long enough, everything that's there now has been there before. So it comes and goes, everything. They try to sell it to you as this is the diet revolution. It's a secret that nobody wants you to know. There's always this hype around it. There's usually a semi-plausible biological story. Then write a book. Then sell the book. Then get a couple of TV shows, and boom, you're in. <laughs> That's all it takes. I admire those people, because those people are able to do something that I have not been able to do, and that is actually make money out of <laughs> this whole area. And this is one of my favorite examples here is Michael Douglas. He's saying, I look so good because I'm gluten-free. Grains contain a protein called gluten. Gluten-free diets usually involve avoiding wheat, barley, rye, or hybrid of these grains. A third of the population thinks that they should be gluten-free. We're not talking about those individuals that have celiac disease. That's about 1% of the population. We're not even talking about that more controversial category of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. We're talking about individuals that are going gluten-free because they think it's healthier, and also, also they think it is a logical weight loss strategy. Is there any evidence to support that? Is going gluten-free healthier? Is it a good weight loss strategy? The answer is no and no. So we have that kind of craziness. And then we also have the kind of craziness around specific diets that are supposed to be ultra healthy. I have to turn to my idol, Tom Brady. I'm a huge fan of the Patriots. I don't know if you knew this, Tom Brady, the greatest quarterback of all time. He is. Um, <laughs> he has this extremely strict diet. And this is very similar to other diets that are coming out right now. For example, he can have no white sugar, no white flour, no MSG, no caffeine, no fungus, no dairy, no nightshades, all of these things, right? Now, some of that's a healthy living, but most of it is just, you know, bunk, as I say. Uh, but it's become incredibly popular, so popular, in fact, that the Maple Leafs, you know, they look at Tom's success, and the Maple Leafs say, you know what? We're going to start eating this way, too. We're going to follow Tom's advice, because that's what's wrong with the Maple Leafs. <laughs> They don't eat enough kale. If they ate more kale, <laughs> is there any evidence to support this? No, no, there's not. So many diets, so many weight loss strategies. Is there anything that actually works? Is there anything that has been shown to keep us healthy, if not slim? If you're thinking about trying to eat healthier, and there is data to show that things like the Mediterranean diet are healthy. Lots of fruits and vegetables, 
whole grains, healthy proteins, nuts, healthy oils. There's no magic, right? That's the healthy diet. Sandro Dernini is the coordinator of the Forum on Mediterranean Food Cultures and a consultant at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, located in Rome, Italy. The FAO focuses on sustainable diets and sustainable food systems. Sandro's area of expertise is dissecting and making sense of the Mediterranean diet. What is the Mediterranean diet? Is built on a balanced composition of a different uh, typology of a food is a range of uh, diversity. The Mediterranean diet does involve avoiding unhealthy food, but it also focuses on traditional foods eaten in countries like Italy and Greece, a certain amount of vegetables, fruits, and grains. The Mediterranean diet does not criminalize the red meat or the sweet. Some researchers believe that one of the reasons that the diet holds value relates to the relationship that Southern Europeans have to food. It is an expression of our culture, and for us, food, it is part of the culture. Food is something that you have not to feel guilty, you have a pleasure to eat. Not just what we eat, but how we eat the time we take to digest, the people we eat with, and how we interact with our food. If we say that the Mediterranean diet is an healthy diet, yes, is a complex of a factor that are related to your lifestyle. Like so many others, the Mediterranean diet is being co-opted by the diet industry and pop culture. It's being adapted, changed, and marketed, so it's important to remember its core philosophies. Food as a value, if you don't give the value to the food, and it means to give time to the food, you are just eating nutrients. We are not eating carbohydrates. We are not eating fat acid. We are, we are eating food. While the Mediterranean diet is a healthy choice, fad diets come and go, leaving the same aftertaste of disappointment. Not only has food done this, Exercise trends go through cycles too. Paradoxically, a 2017 study from the CDC tells us that 80% of Americans don't get enough exercise. But this hasn't stopped the growth of the fitness industry. Wishful thinking sells. Like dieting, these weight loss programs often come with an image, a brand, and a promise of a desirable lifestyle. You feel like you're part of a community and you're telling people, this is the kind of individual I am. I think that's kind of good and bad. I think that uh, sometimes it forces people to, to focus more on the image that they're projecting instead of the activity. But hey, whatever gets people active, whatever gets people embracing exercise, that's awesome. Community is a major part of dieting and working out. CrossFit, spin class, gluten-free restaurants, they all have an element of involvement to them. That can be a significant reason why people are buying in. It also goes to this idea that we're you know, criticizing some people for the kind of workout they're doing, and that is not the message at all. If you love what you're doing or you found a community that you enjoy doing this with, that's awesome, even if it's not the optimum workout. Say, for example, yoga yeah, or Zumba, any of these things. You know, if again, do something that you like, and uh, you're right, people like to feel part of a community and uh, be with like-minded folks. If it's something that's going to get people exercising and moving, then the pros are going to outweigh the cons. We can't forget that the obesity epidemic, as it's been called, is a significant public health challenge. Obesity is when abnormal or excess body fat impairs your health. And if you have a health problem that is driven by the presence of excess body fat, then you have obesity. And countries all over the world have strived to deal with this. No country has been successful in turning this around. Obesity is a complex subject. So complex, the scientific community can't even agree if it's a disease. But they all agree it's a condition that can lead to a spectrum of health problems. According to the NIH, 
nearly 70% of Americans are obese or overweight. It has a myriad, a multitude of symptoms of which being overweight is part from diabetes, blood pressure, sleeping problems at night, people snoring and can't breathe properly, joint problems, cancers. The list goes on and on. Obesity is a serious international problem, and as such, it's been a dominant policy issue for many governments. Before that law was signed, the average school here in this state, uh, the lunch had more than 900 calories. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of calories in a lunch for some kids. Billions have been spent studying the issue, and yet the problem is increasing. The question is not, oh, everybody gains weight because they eat too many calories. Well, that's saying like everybody who's depressed is depressed because they're not happy. That's nonsense. The real question is, why are they eating too much? One person is eating too much, why? Because they're bored. The next person's got emotional issues, then you've got the person who's got depression, then you've got the person who's on medication, then you've got the person who's got genetics that's driving them to eat. One person is eating too much because they work night shifts. They're all different. One thing we do know, blaming, shaming, or scaring is not a constructive strategy. Obesity bias in society and media is a real problem. Misplacing the blame heightens obesity bias, which in turn leads to stigmatization and more weight gain. It is a global problem uh, for which uh, global solutions need to be found. When a problem is as complex and frustrating as weight loss, it can be easy to fall for a promising looking technological gimmick. And for weight loss, the advertising of new high-tech products and procedures seems endless. Sciencey looking products are everywhere. After FDA approval, laser fat removal has become an increasingly popular choice. Now, some predict the market for these kinds of procedures is set to explode. It's a non-invasive, Coles-level laser, which is why she feels nothing. But still, it does work the entire body, from the face right down to, essentially, the calves. Laser surgery is advertised as a non-surgical way to remove fat. The advertising usually includes advantages such as reduced risk, cost, and healing time as compared to surgery. As the laser is passing over the subcutaneous fat cells, it's creating a pore in the fat cell, and then it'll drain out the toxins. Those toxins will then be filtered through the liver and actually released from the body through the urine. And then, obviously, as the toxins release, the, the fat cells will shrink, and the body will, in turn, shrink. So basically, your body's doing the work to get rid of it. One big question with this procedure, if a laser is pointed at your body and running over and over your skin, what are the side effects? Sometimes people do find that the urine might change in color, uh, but normally, no, there's no side effects at all. I'm definitely skeptical. While a few industry-sponsored studies have found modest fat reduction, it seems like a stretch just to lie there and have a futuristic laser do all the work. Every single person who's come in here has had results. They say the least that you can lose is about three inches in total, but we've seen up to 40 inches lost. They're completely reshaped. It's more of that hourglass figure. Um, and where there was bulges, there aren't any more. Indeed, one study suggests that much of the fat returns within a few weeks. I can't find any studies to confirm the promised toxin zapping drastic weight loss results. Still, you can understand why someone might prefer trying lightsabers and lasers to other drastic approaches, such as surgery, which can result in complications if not properly done. I think people are just really afraid to go under the knife now. Anything that can happen with um, an actual invasive surgery, you can't really fix after that, and you can't return to your normal self, and I think that really does scare people. And these lasers are only one example of the drastic steps people will take for weight loss. So what kind of drastic steps am I talking about? How about a feeding tube diet? So they put a feeding tube down your nose, and that's the only uh, food you get for a particular amount of time. I'm the biggest person in my family, pretty much. I went from being extremely active, boxing and things like that, and being very fit to I can eat like this. I don't have to exercise. I'll be fine. Next thing you know, it's ballooned up. Nothing seemed to work because of my own habits. You know, I drank a lot of beer. I ate a lot of pasta. I grew up, my mom made a lot of Italian food, put a lot of bad things, and she didn't know any better. I've gotten to the point right now where I gained more weight, and because of that, my knees started going. I can barely walk. I, have, uh, I live in a two-story house. I can barely make it to bed at night. Came to the point where I just want to live. Jimmy is at some point where it's hurting him, and he's recognizing there's a problem. 
I'm tired of being afraid I'm going to die. Unfortunately, he's already had a lot of damage that's going to be irreparable. But he can stop sliding down that damage slope now so that he's not as bad off. So this is going to go in. You're going to feel it kind of in the back. OK. And that's when you need to take Third the straw okay. and just swallow. This is sliding a tube down into your stomach and feeding you 800 calories a day. All right, so here we go. I'm just going to aim it into your nostril and on down. And right about here, it's at the back of your throat. So go ahead and swallow. There you go. And I can actually feel you grabbing it. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. So that's it. Awesome. It's going to be right at that depth. You are now being fed. Awesome. You're eating without <laughs> chewing. He's getting all the vitamins, all the minerals, all the nutrients. It's helping him lose weight where he didn't have the willpower or the knowledge before. The average weight loss for this is 6% to 9%. The purpose of this is to get you through the carbohydrate withdrawal. Because carbohydrates stimulate the same portion of your brain as cocaine and heroin. And that addiction center is what we're trying to get rid of. You're going to go home. Mm -hmm. You're going to make sure you're doing 30 minutes of physical activity. So literally just take your girlfriend and go walk around the block. I want to get down to 240. That's my goal. I expect to lose maybe 20 pounds. If it's more, awesome. If not, whatever. But it'll take the weight off my knees. And I'll get my body back in shape, my, my metabolism working again. My initial goal is just to be healthy. I want to enjoy my life. I want to enjoy my life with my girlfriend. If I kept going, I would say I have maybe 10 years, and the next 10 years will be horrible. I'll lose my feet, <laughs> things like that. If I didn't change, if I didn't change where I was going to go, either that or just be a sudden heart attack. Now with this, my life's getting better. I'm able to straighten some things out, and we should be good as long as I stick to it. I, I'm the one who has to have the willpower. Jimmy was 369 pounds before the feeding tube diet. By the end, he was 322, a total loss of 58 pounds. But whenever you cut calories and deprive your body of food, you'll lose weight. Serious questions remain to be answered. What negative effects does this kind of extreme approach have on the body? How open is this treatment to abuse? Will the weight stay off long term? These are for Jimmy to discover. There is one drastic step that does work, and that's bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery is a drastic step again. It's serious surgery, you guys, and should not be taken lightly. Weight loss strategies can be placed on a continuum. Some are less invasive, such as a simple change in what we eat. But when the need to lose weight is about life or death, people will go to the extreme in search of a solution. The two operations that are usually done are either a sleeve gastrectomy or a Rouen Y gastric bypass. Sleeve gastrectomy is a simpler procedure. We take off the big curve of the stomach. Essentially, we turn the stomach into a banana. First of all, it's restrictive. You put breakfast in there, you feel full, you don't feel like anything else. The other thing that it does is it removes the hormones that drive appetite. The bypass operation, it's a major rearrangement of the gut. The stomach is made into a pouch no bigger than two of my fingers. Another piece of bowel is brought up and stuck onto it, and another part has to be bypassed. It's a triple hit. Restriction, hormones, and malabsorption. Bariatric surgery is remarkably successful. We can cure type 2 diabetes, that is the non-insulin diabetes, in 50% of people. We can cure the condition called obstructive sleep apnea 85% of the time. High blood pressure, 85% of the time. So bariatric surgery, obesity surgery, is a very, very successful and remarkably safe procedure when done in the right place at the right time for the right people. That's the key, the right people. Many people won't qualify for this surgery. And believe me, this is extreme. 
If I was the patient, would I have it? I probably would because I know the data. I know it's better than anything else I could possibly do. But it would be a very hard decision to make. Balancing the risks and benefits can be difficult. But for many, this is a strategy that can work. Bariatric surgery is a major procedure. It alters our internal organs and changes our eating behavior. The average weight loss with bariatric surgery is what? 20 to 30 percent of your starting weight. The way that the surgery actually works is it changes your body's ability to defend its body weight. Let's say you're at 250 pounds, your body doesn't care how you got to 250 pounds, it's going to defend 250 pounds no matter what you try to do. And somehow you have bariatric surgery and suddenly your body is no longer defending 250 pounds, it's now defending a, you know, 170 pounds. And there's no question that your health is going to be a lot better. For the right patients, bariatric surgery is a risky but proven approach to some of the key issues associated with obesity. So why don't we see a large number of individuals with obesity lining up to do it? Well, in fact, we kind of do. In many countries, there's a long waiting list. This has resulted in the growth of an alternative, much riskier approach to getting the surgery done. Some people are traveling all over the world in order to get surgery that perhaps they didn't get in their home country, or perhaps their home country said that they didn't fit the criteria for that surgery. Medical tourism has been an ever-increasing issue. What happens, an obese patient says, I recognize that I've got a problem, I'd like to go and get something done. Well, it takes a long time. It takes about a year before you get into the clinic. Then you spend about a year going around, getting all the assessments done. Then you might be on the surgical waiting list for another year, so three years before you even start on that process. So people say, no, I don't want that. And medicine, in general, can be turned into a business. And that's what they do in Guadalajara and Tijuana and all these different places. They have a travel company that organizes your trip and you go with your friends and turn it into a nice little holiday. This gives the term some meaning, medical tourism. A holiday full of sun and shopping and, of course, life-altering surgery. Done in remote clinics that often involve unknown doctors and no insurance, still, it's marketed as fast and easy and it'll be home in no time. Problem is when it goes wrong. If it goes horribly wrong, it will go very horribly wrong. What happens is they go overseas, the surgery doesn't go well, they come back to their home country uh, with complications, and that actually costs a lot of money. In addition to the challenges of money and time, it can also be deadly. Indeed, one study identified 26 reported cases of death associated with cosmetic or bariatric medical tourism over an eight-year period. And these are just the ones that made the news. In uh, 2011, I weighed 192.5 pounds. There was an ad in the paper that said, weight loss forever. And so I picked up the phone. I said, how is that possible? I mean, that's everybody's dream, weight loss forever? It's more like a trip to Mexico. It's palm trees. This is like, oh, by the way, we're just going to stop in and we're going to remove part of your stomach. 1% chance of anything going wrong. I went for it. and. Um, that was the downturn of my health issues at that point. Connie Kempton lived through a medical tourism nightmare. She found an out-of-country doctor to perform the surgery, but things didn't go as planned. They rent the rooms, they rent the nurses, they rent the equipment. Everything is rented. If you're only in there for a few days, then you move to a hotel, and then you get to go shopping. Well, in my case, I never saw no shopping, I never saw no beach. The doctors performed the standard stomach cuts but the procedure resulted in leakage and complications. Connie was forced to stay in Mexico. She left the hospital and stayed in a hotel. They continued to cut her stomach, attempting to seal the leaks. This made her stomach smaller and smaller. In the end, she had very little stomach left. They just couldn't get the surgery right. I knew something was not right. I knew something was terribly wrong. I'm getting weaker, constant bladder infections, constant infections. I have taken 10 years off my life. I am on uh, constant medications. And um, I gotta learn to live with that now. I have reached a low of 108. Oh, look at her, she looks so good. She can wear a little black dress. Hey, you're gonna live longer than me. Obesity causes death. This 
skin causes death too. Clearly this approach to surgery can be tremendously risky. Thankfully, in Connie's case, she lived through the ordeal, but this had a serious impact on her hunger hormones and her ability to eat. So now I'm never hungry. I'll stand there and I'll watch somebody take a hamburger and put it to their mouth. And I, 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 I can remember that and I miss that. I would like to have, I would like to have Christmas dinner. I would like to have Thanksgiving dinner with my family. I miss those things. You lose most of your humility. You just hope tomorrow will be better. Surgery comes at a price. There are always risks. One has to go with one's eyes widely open uh, when traveling down these very complicated routes. And that's why we work so hard to select appropriately, monitor carefully, not just come down to Tijuana, get an operation, and get back on the plane two days later. It's fair to say that everyone wants to shed a few pounds, despite the truth about weight loss. Americans find doing their own taxes simpler than improving diet and health, right? And, and really, that's so uh, unfortunate because the steps towards a healthy lifestyle are well known and relatively straightforward. They're not easy, but they're well known. Yes, you can get inundated with messages and get confused, but Really, the basics, eat mainly fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, limit sugars. You know, these are fairly simple things that I think pretty much we know. Maybe we don't want to believe, but it's, it's obviously hard for people to follow. There's no magic diet out there that's waiting to be discovered, and there's not one diet that beats another diet because of some magic biological principle. You know, when people say, this diet is not working, what they really mean is, this diet is not helping me lose weight. But when I look at the blood pressure, it's better. When I look at the cholesterol, that's a lot better. When I look at the diabetes, that's gone. All those things have happened. And here they're saying the diet is not working. No, it is working. It's made a huge change. You're 100% you're, you're healthier now than you were when you, before you started. No, no, but it's not working because I'm not losing weight. So not to sound harsh and not to discourage you from watching what you eat, but know the truth about what your health behaviors can achieve. If you're looking at ways to live healthy, for sure exercise is near the top. It's one of the single best things that you can do for your health. Unfortunately, people are doing it for the wrong reasons. You should be doing it to live a healthy lifestyle. You're gonna get so many benefits from being physically active, regardless of whether you lose weight or not. Most of us worry about lifespan, just how long we're gonna live, but we don't necessarily think so much about the, the quality of what that life will be. Clearly exercise is gonna improve both your lifespan, but especially your health span. And so exercise will confer all of those benefits that hopefully make you enjoy life better, even if the number on the scale hasn't changed that, that much. Find an activity that you like. Find a type of exercise that you enjoy, and that's gonna be the best one for you, and do that, and that's more likely that you're gonna stick with it. If you eat healthier, if you do your physical activity, if you sleep better, you feel better about yourself, you're gonna be 100% healthier than you are now, even if you don't drop a single pound. So don't be discouraged. There is a way forward. We need to reframe our thinking, more focus on health and lifestyle, and less focus on the dieting noise that pervades our culture. Diets will come and go, celebrities will be there to endorse weight loss nonsense, and products and extreme strategies will be marketed to us all. So is this the grim reality of weight loss? In a world saturated with false promises, before and after photos, is there really no possible way we can lose weight and keep it off? Is losing weight and keeping it off impossible? No, it's not. It's possible. Is climbing to the top of Mount Everest impossible? No, it's not. Like, there's a thousand guys do it every year. And we're not just talking about climbing to the top of Everest. No, you're going to talk, climb to the top of Everest... And live there. And live there. <laughs> okay. It's all about finding what's the diet that works for you and what's the diet that you're most likely to stay on. The secret to weight loss isn't a secret. It isn't a magical diet or a particular workout. It's about finding a healthy, enjoyable lifestyle that can be maintained forever. It is possible, but it has to be done for the right reasons, for your health and for your happiness.